All right, so our next speaker is Carl Lansteiner, who will tell us about anomalous transport from anti de space to wild semi-metals. Okay, so Walter, I would like to thank the organizers uh, for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to uh, present this work. Uh, what I'm going to say is uh, based on a review which I've put on the net last year, and there's a more recent paper which actually appeared in Contmart. And not only this, it's actually an experimental paper. So, so and what I will talk about yeah, is uh, how you can transport the intuition and what you have learned about certain transport, transport ph phenomena that are related to anomalies uh, to some real materials which people can study in the lab. So here's the outline of my talk. I will just briefly introduce how anomalies can induce these quantum currents and then discuss wild semi-metals and how this anomalous transport is realized in wild semi-metals and give some summary. Okay, so my anomalies here are not these fancy anomalies which have appeared before, for example, in UH's talk, uh, which were bosonic and odd dimensions and, and discrete. My anomalies here, they are good old-fashioned garden variety triangle anomalies. Um, there are two kinds of them in two dimensions. Uh, so this is the usual uh, triangle anomaly with three gauge currents on the vertices, or three currents on the vertices, and that's uh, the mixed gauge gravitational anomaly, or gravitational contribution to this uh, chiral anomaly. Uh, both of them can easily be detected from the fermion, massless fermion spectrum, so you have to compute this. I will simply, for simplicity, consider U1 theories, so you, you imagine you have a bunch of U1 symmetries, you label them by an index A, and then to compute this uh, anomaly coefficient, which tells you if this term is here, you sum, you compute this triple sum, so the right-handed minus the left-handed charges. And for this guy here, you have to compute this coefficient, just the sum over the charges of the right-handed minus left-handed um, charges. Okay. Now, this is actually the, the, the result of what... Uh, but what's happening is these anomalies, when you have uh, such a system which has these anomalies, and you introduce chemical potentials for the symmetries, saying you have a chemical potential in the symmetry number B, and you switch on a magnetic field in the symmetry number C. So I allow myself to introduce gauge fields which couple to all these currents uh, labeled by A, and for all these gauge fields, I allow myself also to introduce background fields, like a background magnetic field. And then if you have this DABC anomaly coefficient, then you get a current in the, in the uh, symmetry number A. And it's determined here precisely by this anomaly coefficient. And uh, if you look to the energy current, how much energy transpo is transported uh, when you have such a magnetic field, it's quadratic now in the chemical potentials. And there's a new term appearing which is just T squared, the square of temperature. And omega here will not be, play such a big role that uh, vorticity or rotation, so if you rotate chiral fermions, they start to move also in, along these ways, determined by these anomaly coefficients. What's important uh, and, and very interesting about this is that these are dissipationless currents, so, so they don't... Uh, so the, the best picture of what to do is actually this, this thing here. So if this is a, a quantum skier, it hits some impurity. It actually remembers that it's a wave, and it goes around like this and like that. And for the backward scattering, there's actually precise uh, a negative interference, so it can't go back. And if you make up a fluid of such a particle, say, then it's dissipationless. You cannot perturb this flow. Um, and... These flows also don't contribute to entropy production. And you can derive this in many ways, but many of these features are clearest in holography. So many of the things I think have, best understood in, have been best understood in holography, and I should say this has a very long history. So these currents have first appeared in 7980 by papers of Vilenkin, um, where relation to anomaly was not yet uh, established, and then parts of it have been rediscovered over time again and again, and then there were some important papers here uh, coming from ADS-CFT and motivations from coagulum plasma where people studied this, and, and then in hydrodynamics and so on. So there are many of these people are sitting here in the audience who have contributed to that. I'm sure I've forgotten some. Uh, 
Um, but when you, when you think about this, let me see. Um, when you think about this, there is, uh, there's a reason why this thing was forgotten for a long time. And I will, I will come to that. Now, uh, here I have uh, sketched a little bit one way of deriving these transport coefficients. And this is uh, a sort of an effective low energy theory where you just care about energy and charge transport. You write down some uh, conservation laws. So that's just uh, energy transport. And here this is if you have a current and an electric field, you inject energy into the system that's taking care of this. Uh, and then there's the charge current and you assume it has an anomaly. And then you try, you write down this what is called constitutive relations. You, you suppose that the currents are generated by gradients in temperature, by external electric field or gradients in chemical potentials. And you allow for this magnetic field as well. Actually, you have to introduce it. And then you try to construct an entropy current. And the entropy current locally should be, the entropy production should be positive definite. So you impose this second law of thermodynamics. That gives constraints on this transport coefficient. So this matrix L has to be symmetric, positive, definite, et cetera, et cetera. But these guys are almost completely determined. So these currents which are generated by this magnetic field are almost completely determined. And this coefficient, which is the, the current, charge current you generate, is just given by an anomaly coefficient times mu. And this, which tells you how much energy current is generated, is uh, given by this mu squared term times anomaly coefficient. But it has an integration constant. And this integration constant you can uh, show is proportional to t squared. But the, the number in front is undetermined here. And um, the reason for this is going back here. I've ignored this contribution. And there was a good reason for it, because this term is actually fourth order in derivatives, whereas this is two orders in derivatives. And so in this effective low energy theory, which I'm writing down, I write only down all these terms here, one order in derivatives, and I have no reason to include here this uh, fourth order derivative term. So, so a priori, you would guess that the, this gravitational contribution doesn't play any role for this uh, gain. Um, now, why this thing got forgotten for a long time is, uh, uh, here, I try to pinpoint this. If you, if you study uh, these expressions for a Dirac fermion, so a Dirac fermion is just a left-handed and a right-handed fermion, and it's much nicer to think about it as, as a vector and axial symmetry. So you, have, you rotate the faces of the fermions left and right in the same or in the opposite way, and you call this axial and vector symmetries, and you compute this uh, anomaly coefficient. It's completely symmetric, so that you can place the five wherever you want. And that gives rise to three effects. So this is the proper chiral magnetic effect. That is called chiral separation effect, and that you might want to call axial magnetic effect. But at this point, you, know, you, want, you want this guy to interpret as the electric current. And that tells you that if you have this chemical potential and the magnetic field, which are all um, quantities which are a priori well-defined in equilibrium, you get a current. And it should be an electric current, because it's the vector current of the Dirac fermion. Um, so like that would be QED. But there is an old argument due to Bloch from the 1930s, I think, going back, and then several people have studied this uh, recently also, which says that for a gauge current, a U1 gauge current, you cannot have an expectation value at, uh, in the ground state. Otherwise, you could introduce a pure gauge field configuration and lower its energy. So that, that can't happen. Still, this formula tells you that there is this current. And there are some subtleties to all these expressions. So all these expressions need proper interpretation. And the best way of interpreting these formulas is studying it in anti -decitor space. I think I can skip this slide here in this audience. You all know this. Uh, what's anti -decitor space? But uh, let me specify how I introduce these anomalies. So the, the usual rule is anomaly in ADS is a John Simons term. So if I go back to my Dirac fermion, I have a left-handed and a right-handed symmetry. So what I would do is I would uh, say the first step, I would introduce a John Simons term for the left-handed U1 symmetry and a John Simons term for the right-handed U1 symmetry. So make a, if I make a gauge transformation only on the left-handed uh, U1 symmetry, that's a, a, a total derivative. And I get only the boundary term, which is just FHF, which is the anomaly, and the same for the right-handed. But that's actually not what I want. Uh, it's much better to write it in this axial vector basis where I can write down this John Simons term. And now in this John Simons term, that's what's special about it is that the, the actual vector-like 
the H connection doesn't appear. The difference between these two forms of John Simon's term is a boundary term, and it's known as Bardeen counter term. And this is much nicer because this guarantees that there's no anomaly in the vector current. Now, if you calculate now the vector current, there is the usual contribution from the ADS-CFD dictionary, which is sort of the subleading term in the expansion of this gauge field, which is this guy. But there's a second contribution, which comes now from this particular form of John Simon's term, and it's this polynomial. Now, uh, both of them contribute to the effect I want to calculate in a magnetic field. From the first term, I get this, which we have already seen, but from the second term, I get this, where I want to distinguish for the moment between the temporal component of a gauge field and the chemical potential. So you get actually two, and the second comes from, from the John Simons term. Now, it's important to realize that that's, that's a pure UV effect, that's because that sits at the boundary. So I don't have to do any calculation in ADS to evaluate this because that's just determined by boundary conditions, whereas this I really have to solve for the theory and calculate this. Now, the usual argument in ADS, if you really want to be study thermal equilibrium, you have to be able to analytically continue your geometry to Euclidean, to a smooth Euclidean geometry, and that's possible if and only if this uh, boundary value of the temporal gauge field takes precisely the value of the chemical potential. Okay? And if you, they are, then are in strict equilibrium, you see that it indeed vanishes, as it should for a true gauge current. Okay? So here, that I think you should, of course, you can do this also in quantum field theory, but it's simplest and easiest, most transparent, to see where these different terms come from in the ADS-CFT correspondence. And for the cognoscenti, um, this guy is what is called the covariant current, and this is the so-called bardeen sumino polynomial, and that harks back to an old theory by Bardeen and Sumino from the mid-'80s, uh, where there are different forms of anomalies, covariant and consistent anomalies. And the actually true physical current is the consistent uh, current. I just conserved. Oh, I'm going in the wrong direction. So, okay. So, good. Now let's do the same thing for the gravitational anomaly. Okay. So what happens when, I, 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 again, I write down just this John Simons term, but this John Simons term is, is quite different because I have the five-dimensional curvature there. And so if I do a gauge transformation on this A, I not only pick up the anomaly, the anomaly knows only about the four-dimensional and intrinsic curvature of the boundary theory, but I also pick up this additional term, which is the extrinsic curvature. So the extrinsic curvature tells you how your boundary manifold gets get stretched as you move inside or, or, or compressed as you move inside ADS. Now, if you, if you study this in asymptotically ante the sitter space and you go out to the boundary, that term doesn't contribute on the boundary. That term is uh, subleading, and as you go to the boundary, this vanishes, and you see only what you want to see, the anomaly. Okay? So that's good. But Suppose you want to do what Aristomenos was talking in the first talk today. You want to implement this membrane paradigm, and you want to construct a theory that lives just outside the horizon of a black hole. Now, this term, which is harmless at infinity, it hits you. For, it hits you. Okay? So let's evaluate this term for such a perturbed black hole metric, where I introduced here a sort of what is called gravitomagnetic perturbation, and then this, this extrinsic curvature term boils down to this expression. And here you pick up, this is the blackening factor of the black hole, so you pick up the derivative of this blackening factor at the horizon, squared, because there are two k's, so that's temperature squared, right? And this guy you want to call gravitoelectric field, and this guy you can call gravitomagnetic field. So in this membrane paradigm way of computing things, you suddenly think your current has an anomaly, because the right-hand side, these k terms, these extrinsic curvature terms, they don't vanish, but they just give t squared times inner product of gravitoelectric with gravitomagnetic field. And now, this is very suggestive, that it looks like just an anomaly, right? The anomaly looks like this. d mu j mu is coupling squared uh, in a electric field in magnetic field. And so this is sort of the coupling, because for gravity, the coupling is energy, which is in the thermal bath, the temperature. But of course, it's not the real anomaly, because when you have a thermal path, there are additional variables. A thermal path is specified by a frame. 
So there is a time-like vector whose length is the temperature, one over the temperature, and whose spatial components are sort of the fluid uh, velocity. So if you use that, uh, these sort of variables come for free in the thermal bath, and you can write this term as the gradient of a current. And now you interpret it not as an anomaly, but as the gradient of a current. And the current is precisely this t squared term. And now you understand that this gravitational coefficient comes there because it originates precisely from this five-dimensional trans Simons term, which have to have this coefficient because you want to match to the gravitational anomaly on the boundary. Okay? So actually what this tells you is that the good membrane current is not just this guy here, which you would naively have guessed, but the good membrane current has this contribution from the extrinsic curvature. And so we have uh, sort of formalized this in the recent uh, work, which is hopefully to appear uh, in the next few days on the net. Good. So, so far to the, so I want to emphasize this. This is really, that shows like in the, in the, in the usual current magnetic effect, I had this UV and this IR contribution. And here you also have a UV contribution, but it's a UV contribution which fulfills all your expectations about higher derivatives. It's fourth order in derivatives. So at this moment, we just don't care about it. But once you're in a thermal bath, one of these derivatives in ADS gets converted into a derivative into the uh, holographic direction, and it tells you that the actual good current to look at is this one. Okay? And actually, if you do this, what Aristomenos was saying, try to pick up this, construct these charges, which are invariant, conserved along the RG flow, it's actually this current on which such a construction has to be based. So, from the, so in, in, in this holographic RG flow equations, from, from this counter term on the membrane, along the RG flow, it is moving into the actual current. Okay, so what are wild semi-metals? Wild semi-metals, uh, well, they were one of the top 10 breakthrough in physics in 2015. So it is a new class of material. Uh, if you Google for wild semi-metals and you look for images, so that's some typical images you get. Um, there are lots of materials now available. This is thallium arsenide, zirconium pentatelluride, niobium phosphide. Uh, all these materials, what they have is, I, I don't know if you can see it, but actually this is the band structure of this thallium arsenide. And what is really interesting us about this band structure is this little, little region here. Okay? So, uh, for your convenience, I have made a blow up of this region. So that looks, morally speaking, like that. So there are there's the Fermi level, so all the electronic states are filled in this material until the Fermi level, and there are these band crossing points. So there is uh, this band here, and it crosses with this other band here. Around these band crossing points, the local Hamiltonian has no other choice. It's a two-level system, so there's an upper band, a lower band. It's a two-level system, and all two-level systems are described by poly matrices times a parameter, and the parameter is the momentum, the local momentum around this point. So the Hamiltonian is sigma in K with the local K around here. But for the sigma matrices, we have actually two choices of signs, which are unitarily inequivalent, and these are, of course, left and correspond to left and right-handed fermions. And it's an old result due to Nielsen and Nina Mia that in such a periodic lattice in a, in a crystal, uh, such band crossing points can be described by chiral fermions, by wild fermions, but they always come in pairs of left-handed and right-handed fermions, which our colleagues from lattice gauge theory, uh, which prevents our colleagues from lattice gauge theory to put the standard model on the lattice. But, um, but okay, here it's welcome in this, in this um, wild semi-metal. So, but what's different from usual uh, wild fermions is that the origin of this crossing point, this node of this wild cone, is shifted from the origin of momentum space. So they are shifted here in opposite directions and in energies. Okay? So if you want to write down a low energy effective theory for this electronics of this material, that's the equation you would write down. So this is just a, f a four uh, component Dirac spinner with left and right handed uh, components and that's a usual covariant derivative but it has this additional term which couples with gamma 5 and that's a constant 4 vector and it shifts the crossing points away from the origin to these new locations which are further out in the brillo zone. Okay? Now from our high energy perspective it is very convenient to think about this guy as an axial uh, vector field. 
it's not a gauge field because there's the axial symmetry. It's not a gauge field, but it's an axial vector field. So it couples with gamma 5. It does precisely what you would do when you say on a classical level would like to introduce an axial gauge field. So let's blow up this picture even a little bit more and study this uh, theory. So what's happening um, in in condensed matter, you would measure energy, say, with respect to, to the bottom of the brillioson. But in high energy, we don't do this. In high energy, we introduce normal ordered vacuums uh, in quantum field theory, which lie at the tips of the wild cones. So if I want to do a quantum mechanical treatment of this, I have to few these guys down here, which are in black as the Fermi C, and these guys, these electrons above the tip, I, I consider as states occupied above the vacuum. So there's a left-handed chemical potential, there's a right-handed chemical potential, and they're different. But they're different just by that amount in which these wild cones are shifted against each other. Okay? And I, can I, I, I can apply my theory, my formula for this kind of magnetic effect, which I have derived, say, in uh, ADS-CFT, and I can get uh, the uh, fantastic prediction that in such a material, if I apply a magnetic field, nothing is happening. That is true, so it's a successful prediction, but it's not very exciting. Okay? So we can do better than that. So how do we do better than that? Well, the reason why it vanishes is that in this equilibrium situation, this mu5, because it's just shifted, these mu's are just compensating here for the shift in energies, um, of these wide crossing points, uh, in equilibrium this always cancels, but if I go out of equilibrium and if I manage to induce a mu5, change the filling level here somehow, then this term doesn't vanish anymore and it should contribute to electronic transport. So, and uh, a very nice way of doing this is using the anomaly by itself. So the anomaly tells you if you have parallel electric and magnetic field, you pump axial charge into the system. Now, axial charge just means that the Fermi level of the left-handed say rises and, and the Fermi level of the right-handed guys goes down. So you generate a mu5. But um, the, of course, in, in, this is a real crystal and in the real world these are not real vial fermions. There's a limit to it because these bands necessarily depend over and they are connected so they are, they are always uh, tails in the amplitude of a fermion which sits around here uh, which are actually not chiral. So, so there's always a finite amplitude for this chiral fermion, which is sitting here to tunnel, so to speak, over into this other cone and change its chirality. So uh, this is taken into account here by a relaxation term. I just assume that this axial charge relaxes over a time scale T5, which is a comparatively long time scale in these materials. And then you can go to a steady state where you don't generate any axial charge and and then the uh, axial uh, charge, which you act effectively have in your system, is just given by this relaxation time times the anomaly. Okay? And you can translate this via this uh, susceptibility into a chemical potential and plug this into this transport formula, where sigma is the usual ohmic conductivity, and this is this uh, kind of magnetic conductivity, where induced now this, where here you write down what you have learned from the anomaly, how large this mu5 is. And so that's the prediction you get from this very simple theory. You get the prediction that the conductivity is enhanced uh, with the magnetic field, and it goes quadratically with the magnetic field. But this is true only for low magnetic field, because if you go to large magnetic fields, you need to take into account the susceptibility factor, and that large magnetic fields, when only the lowest lambda level contributes, that's basically just the density of states in the lowest lambda level, which is itself just the magnetic field. So at large magnetic field, there's a, a cancellation here of one power because this thing becomes proportional to B. So at large magnetic field, you expect this thing to scale linearly with the magnetic field. Okay, very good. Now, there in, uh, so while usually in ADS-CFT, we are interested in the situation where the electrons in the metal are very strongly interacting, uh, a usual metal is more like this. So what in a usual metal the electrons do is they hit these impurities here, there's this very nice uh, picture, uh, image done by Jan, this article. Um, I ruthlessly stole it. <laughs> and so most of the time they hit an impurity, and for the wild semi-metal, what, what happens when they hit an impurity is 
the electrons sit here in this vial cone, they think they are left-handed and they hit an impurity, but most of the time they just stay left-handed, they change their momentum. So momentum is not conserved because of these impurities here, but from time to time they hit this impurity very, very hard, and then they jump over to the other vial cone, and this is called intervalley. So in condensed matter, these vial cones are often called valleys, and this is called intervalley scattering rate. And the typical hierarchy of scales is that this inner valley scattering, where the, uh, Fermi, the electron doesn't change its chirality, is very fast, that's a short scale, and then this inter valley scattering time is much larger, and then even larger is the interaction time. So the electrons know that there are other electrons on a much, much longer time scale for this usual, typically weakly coupled uh, metals described, say, by kinetic theory. So you can use this. This means that basically the left-handed electrons and the right-handed electrons, for most of the time, they don't know anything of each other. They just go ahead and bump their head against these impurities. Now you can build up an effective theory that takes this into account because now also the energies of these two uh, populations, left and right-handed, are separately conserved over a very long time scale, this intervalley time scale, intervalley scattering time scale. So actually what you should do is you should take energy transport for each vial cone into account in a magnetic field. And now you get a handle to this strange T squared term, which I can relate via holography to the gravitational anomaly. Uh, and what you can do is you can apply a temperature gradient. If you apply a temperature gradient, you pump energy into the uh, vial cone. But depending on the sign, if it's left or right-handed, you either pump energy inside or you sort of extract energy. The total energy is conserved because the vial cones always come with opposite signs because of Linz and Minamia. So energy, of course, is not violated. But locally, in one vial cone, you pump, so to speak, energy from one to the other. And locally, so for the short time scales, you can also think that you can keep this population on slightly different temperatures then. And so you go through the same arguments as before, but you take this energy transport into account, and now you find that there are two contributions. Now you, can, you get, as before, if you switch on an electric field, you get also this anomaly, and you get an enhancement of the current due to an electric field and a magnetic field, parallel electric and magnetic fields. But the new thing is you also get an enhancement of this is the electric current, so this is the electric current generated by gradient in temperature. And you get an enhancement of this electric current parallel uh, proportional to also B squared here. So these are some thermodynamic derivatives of this uh, wild fermion free uh, energy. And you get an, 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 a similar enhancement in this thermoelectric conductivity. But one difference is that if you go here to large magnetic fields, I told you it's only the lowest lander level that contributes, and that cancels the power of B, because here basically I see the density of states. This is different. This guy is proportional to the derivative of the, of the density with respect to temperature. But if you're in the lowest lander level, your density of states is dominated completely by the magnetic field and insensitive to temperature. So this term vanishes at large magnetic field. So this is a very, very simple theory which you can apply to the wild semi-metal and it's based only on this anomalous transport uh, coefficient, and it makes the following prediction. At low temperature, you apply temperature gradient. At low magnetic field, you see a quadratic enhancement if the magnetic field is in the direction of the temperature gradient. And at large magnetic field, the effect should switch off because then electrons are primarily, populate primarily the lowest lambda level, and then this term vanishes. Okay? So that's, that's not a quantitative theory, but it tells you what to look for in an experiment. Okay. So let's look for an experiment. So uh, this group of people, uh, collaboration from uh, the Institute of Quantum Chemistry and Complex System in Dresden and the IBM Research Center in Rüschlikon in Zurich, they have done this. They have, uh, they have synthesized the material, niobium phosphide, which is a wild semi-metal. It's a bit complicated because it's a wild semi-metal only if you dope it with gallium such that the Fermi level goes close to these crossing points. And so they have made one set of experiments where they apply an electric field parallel to the magnetic field and they see a quadratic enhancement of the conductivity and at larger magnetic fields it sort of becomes linear or at least subquadratic. Okay? And in a second set of experiments they have just done what I told you. Um, they have applied a temperature gradient parallel to this magnetic field. And lo and behold, uh, 
I told you that what you expect is quadratic at small magnetic field and the effect switching off at large magnetic field. Okay, so this is, the, the, this is how much current you get. As you switch on the magnetic field, you get more and more current. It grows quadratically until you are at like 4, 5 Tesla, which is quite strong. Uh, now we think, also this is the region where this thing here becomes, goes away from the quadratic regime, uh, and then the effect switches off. Okay? So this is sort of, uh, so this effect is uh, nowadays considered in uh, condensed matter physics experimental community, the smoking gun for this sort of anomaly uh, taking place in materials, the usual anomaly, and so this you can then uh, equivalently take as the smoking gun for having this T squared, this temperature dependent term, which in one way or the other is related to this gravitational anomaly. Okay, so anomalies have moved from high energy to quantum mud in various ways. Uh, we have seen this several times, I think, already in this conference. There is a rich uh, anomaly induced transport phenomenology. I've talked to you about kind of magnetic effect negative magnetoresistivity, negative thermomagnetoresistivity, difference between them. There are many more anomalous Hall effect, cardinal separation effect, uh, axial magnetic effect, etc., etc. All this anomalous transport theory is very good, very nice to understand much of the exotic physics of these uh, materials. Holography is a great tool to investigate anomalous transport. There are many, many things which are not so easy to understand in quantum field theory. You are able to do it also after some time. But um, holography is, is really fantastic and gives you lots of insight into what's going on. For example, how the gravitational anomaly manages to, to give this transport. And you can also go further and actually construct a holographic model of a wild semi-metal where you sort of try to model also this band pending. And we have done this recently. And, and there, the uh, gravitational anomaly strikes again in a different manner. There's a critical region where this bent, uh, where, where this vile cone, vile semi-metal just is on the verge of becoming a usual metal without this chiral fermions. And in, in this quantum critical region, our model of vile semi-metal predicts a new transport coefficient, which is an odd viscosity. Actually, there are two odd viscosities. So that's also something one can probably study in materials in the future. Okay, thank you. So you, you had this uh, measurements of the conductivity and of the thermal conductivity before, yeah. right? Um, so if you would try to use, uh, let's say, kinetic theory to yeah. model this, do you, are you going to get the same tau 5 for both? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so, this, so I have motivated here this from anomalous transport theory, but people have completely independently down here, Spivak, Andrea, Flundgren, Laurel, and Fiete started this in kinetic theory without having any anomalies uh, in mind, but the same, they find the same effect. So anomalies are pretty universal. You can find them in, in many ways. And I have to say also, there is a paper by Lucas Davison and such stuff where they consider sort of left and right handed decoupled chiral fluids and decouple them slightly like intervalley scattering and define similar effects. Yeah, but I mean, my, my question is more experimental. Let's say if you take your standard formulas for the B squared conductivity yeah. um, and you fit tau 5, do you're going to get the same answer for both measurements? Have you done this? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. They are consistent, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Uh, I have one. You, you mentioned Hall viscosity at the end. Uh, I thought it's not something that's de determined by the anomaly. You mean it's some new transport that comes out of this modeling, but, uh, and we know it exists in systems in 2 plus 1 dimensions, in parity violating systems. But I don't think it's constrained by the anomaly. Is that, uh, did I misunderstand what you said? So this is a different system. So Hall viscosity usually appears in quantum Hall states in two plus one dimensions because of the tensor structure. You're allowed to write this down. Now these are three, three plus one dimensional systems, and, but they are anisotropic, okay? Because precisely at this quantum critical point, there is a special direction and there's a Lifshitz transition. So they are anisotropic. And the anisotropy gives you a preferred direction. And with respect to this preferred direction now, 
you can write down more tensor structures, and that allows the presence of all viscosity. All right, so let's thank Carl again.